Dr. Brandon Williams has nearly 25 years of experience in business technology and information security. He co-founded two tech services company and has authored five books on PCI compliance, focusing on innovative solutions to reduce risk in complex environments. So please welcome Brandon and have fun playing the game. All right. So um, thanks for being willing participants, maybe unwilling, that's okay. Uh, no, no, I want to give you all the instructions. So if, if you're part of a group, yes. If you want to be part of this group, th this, there's a group right there, that's Team B, you can be part of that group. Just make sure we know who's in the group because again, the winning group gets a prize. And it's real, it's not fake. It's not just a clap like it's gift cards that are not, that are real gift cards that actually work. I'm not pranking you. Okay. So first thing I want to do is, um, <clears throat> we're going to have a little bit of controlled chaos with the game. So I'm going to try to do the same thing that we would do with the, the little kindergartners. So when I need to get your attention, I'm going to do, and then what do you guys do? This is a pro. This is okay. Yep. <laughs> okay, so first, we're going to do a quick poll. If you have a pen and paper, great. If you have that person that is in your text string that you always put all of your notes to them and they get random messages with like grocery lists, get that up. We're gonna take a quick poll, okay? First question, performance measures have little or no impact on behavior, have a moderate impact on behavior, but not a major factor, or determine how individuals behave, so A, B, or C. Good, you just, it's in the in, inside voice, you just write it down. Okay. Uh, next one. It is most important that performance measures should accurately reflect past performance or correctly influence future behaviors. So A or B. And the last one, performance measure measurement should focus on the department level and encourage optimal departmental performance. <coughs> True or false? <coughs> okay. So by the way, um, there is a resource pack that will be available to everybody at the end. There's a QR code you can scan, so you're going to get the slides, you're going to get the references, you're going to get all the stuff. So first thing we want to talk about is a little bit of game theory. Now performance management, performance metrics, we are sort of playing games just like we're going to play one here, but we also play them at work. You, most of you have some sort of variable part of your compensation, and there are certain things you have to do in order to earn, exceed, or maybe not earn those things. Probably the easiest one to think about is a salesperson. The salesperson, they make a sale, they earn a commission, great. Um, is anybody here familiar with The Prisoner's Dilemma? Some people, have you ever watched like Law and Order, CSI, any of the crime shows? You're familiar with Prisoner's Dilemma, I'm gonna show you what it is. So this is one of the most basic games that you're gonna learn. If you ever decide to do game theory stuff, there's just a quick video you wanna do. Hopefully the video works. It took a second when we were testing it. If it doesn't work, I'll talk you through what the video says. Yeah, just restart from the beginning, the little bottom left, yep. They, Mr. Blue and Miss Red, have each been arrested for some minor crime. The police think they committed a more serious crime, but they don't have enough evidence to convict them. They need a confession. They take them and put them in separate rooms so they can't talk, and play a little game. To try to force a confession, the police give them each a choice. Admit your partner committed the crime and you will go free. We'll pardon you for the minor crime, but your partner will have to spend three years in prison. If you stay silent and your partner lets us know that you were the one who really did it, then you're gonna have to go away for three years. They know that the police don't have any evidence, and if they both stay silent, then they will only go to prison one year each for the minor crime. If they both betray each other, then they'll both go to prison for two years each. Okay, each partner can do one of two things, stay silent or betray. Staying silent would be cooperating and betraying would be defecting. If they both stay silent, then they each spend a year in prison. If one betrays and the other stays silent, then the betrayer goes free and the silent spends three years in prison. If they both betray, then it's two years each. So what are they gonna do? Well, they should cooperate. That's the best option for the group if we add the total number of years in prison. But let's take it from Red's perspective. If she thinks Blue is gonna stay silent, then she should betray so she can go free. Going free is better than spending
spending a year in prison. If she thinks he's going to betray her, then she should definitely betray. Two years in jail is better than three and being made a fool of. Blue is in the exact same situation and will think the exact same thing. He should betray if she stays silent and he should betray if she betrays. They should have both cooperated, but from an individual standpoint, they notice they could always gain by defecting, if they have no control over what the other person's going to do. So they'll both defect to try to better their own situation, but come away not only hurting the group, but themselves. Individually, they're worse off than if they both cooperated. This situation is pretty made up, but it has some real-world analogs. A common example is with marketing. Advertising. For right. simplicity, let's say their choices are to add... So that's Prisoner's Dilemma. So you see, you know what I'm talking about when you've watched a crime show and you see them put the two suspects in a different, like you've seen this before, you know how it works. Now this is the same matrix, but I made it with negative because I thought jail was supposed to be a deterrent and bad. So like in, in the one where you talk about maximizing payoffs, three is a bigger, bigger number than zero, but it's actually a worse number of three years in jail. So I made it negative here. So this is what you see in these coordination matrices for game theory, but you can kind of understand the point, right? So it, as a collective, it makes sense for them both to stay quiet but their outcomes become better if they defect individually. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Oh, I have that, that's me. Okay, so do you guys know, most people in this room I'm assuming know who Gene Kim is and you've read the Phoenix Project or any of the other ones that he's, hopefully you've read them, if not, those are good ones to read. Gene's, that original book was based on Eli Goldratt's book, The Goal. So if you, if you have an MBA or you're going through your master's program, at some point you're probably gonna read that goal, the book called The Goal and you're gonna learn about the theory constraints. But in this, he talks, Dr. Goldratt talks about performance management, and he says, tell me how you measure me, and I will tell you how I behave, okay? And the other thing he says is, if you measure me in an illogical manner, don't complain about illogical behavior. It makes sense. But have we ever, any of you ever been participating in a performance management system for security that was illogical? I sure have. Like, it, you start to look at the performance saying, okay, if I do this, I look better, but it doesn't actually help the company or doesn't help us reach our goals. So some examples. Um, I'll give you a super basic one. Um, if in security, actually let's talk about uh, tickets. Let's talk about tickets and closing tickets. And um, we all are familiar with ticket systems, right? There are incentive structures on the amount of time a ticket stays open. Now if all I do is say, I'm gonna pay you for closing tickets and the fastest time wins, what is the person on the other side gonna do? Select all, close, right? It doesn't matter the quality of the close. Like the, po the point that they were trying to get to is we want these tickets to be serviced and completed with five stars at the end in a quick and efficient way. That's not how it was worded. It was worded, close the most amount that you can. Okay. So now we're gonna play the game. Now before I start, has anybody heard of the blue-green game before? You have to tell me it's, it's required. Okay. So here's how the game works. So we've already split into four teams, check. You guys are all gonna elect a manager. It doesn't matter who it is, just pick somebody. The person's basically gonna be the tiebreaker if you guys can't come to an agreement as a group and is gonna run the, uh, the envelope up to me. In front of you, you have six envelopes. One envelope has five blue chips and five green chips. You are going to select one of those and you're gonna put them in the round that we're playing. You'll see it's, they're all labeled like round one through five. You don't want anyone else to see that. It's okay if your team sees it, but you don't want anyone else to see that. Okay, you can do it in secret. You're gonna put it in there and you're gonna bring it up here when it's time. Um, there's scores on how this works, right? So we're a collective as a, as a group and as a company, we all succeed when everybody submits a blue chip. Everybody gets one point when you submit a blue chip, okay? One second. The points change. If everybody submits a green chip, everybody loses a point, okay? But there are some sort of puts and takes. If we have one green chip, for example, and three blue chips, then the blue chip loses one, the green chip wins three. Okay, so remember, every, every winning team gets a gift card, and yes, they actually work. So round one, get your manager, secretly put your chip in, bring it up to me. Bring your chips up. Yeah, whoever 
manager is, or if you want to just answer me real fast, just one from here. We're going to try this again. So I just want to take a look at the, the scoring matrix again. So you asked the question. Now, as a company, right, as CEO of the company, that's me, CEO of the company, we all win together when we all submit a blue chip. OK, so round two, submit a chip. You want to go back? Okay, who are the managers in the group? Y'all are all fired. Okay? We're not we're not really listening to you. So now remember the goal here for all of us to win together. In fact, actually what would be good for us to do is I need you to elect a new manager, and then I would like those managers to go like confer in the center there and just kind of be like how you want to submit your chip. Remember, everybody's got to submit a blue chip for us all to win. Okay, so new manager, come right in the center, figure out what you're gonna do, go back to your group, don't, don't bring your chips, you're gonna talk about what you're gonna do, you're gonna go back to your group, put it in there, and submit the chip, points double. Ready, go. chips in the envelope and bring it up.
gonna tell you something that's never happened before. You are all rule followers. There is one team that has submitted one green chip. Which team is that? Yeah. So uh, we're gonna stop the demo in the game now, okay? <laughs> because it's not working correctly. So it's like a, a good, real, live demo. So really the way this typically works, there's always one team that will submit a green chip every time. Why? Yeah. Now, why would that, because they get the most points, because they're getting a prize. So you guys are starting to see the difference. So we would normally do this for two more rounds. I wouldn't fire you guys again. I'd say, hey, are you sure you guys don't need another conference? Do you want to do this again? I mean, we probably could have done that, and I bet you one of the teams would have submitted a green chip. But that's how the game is, is gained and won. And so what we're going to demonstrate is, like, why that's the case. So uh, just like a real live demo, it fell flat. But I do appreciate the participation. We didn't even have to clap, so that was kind of fun. OK. So OK. Let's do the poll again. Remember the poll we did early on? So let's do those polls. Remember what your answers were? So the first question, performance measures have little or no impact, moderate impact, or determine how individuals behave. What's the answer? C. Although strangely not in this group. Um, <laughs> Question two, it's more important that performance measures should accurately, accurately reflect past performance or correctly influence future behaviors? B, correct. Performance measurement should focus on the department level and encourage optimal departmental performance. True or false? False. So that was the, that's, it's true for you guys because you're all rule followers except for these heathens over here, right? So what did we learn had we done this all the way through and it worked the way it was supposed to work? What did we learn? So silos... And we all have silos in our companies. They promote bad behavior because you're not communicating. So remember, like, one of the key things of the game was you guys do the, put the chip in the, in the envelope in secret, right, so that team A can't see what team B is doing over here or if that's what the teams were, right, whatever the, whatever the numbers were. Um, and so if you're irrational, which most of you were not, by the way, if you're a rational person, you act to maximize your payoff, even at the expense of others. So we've probably all seen that, or we've maybe had that one person that you've worked with that's acted in a really strange way until you figure out that they had like done a brain hack and figured out what the performance management system was, and all of a sudden they got a bigger bonus than you. Okay, poor transparency of goals promotes, uh, promotes bad behavior. Because if normally, like let's say the second round, that's the second round where somebody submitted a green chip. If everybody went in the center, and everybody was watching you put the blue chip in the envelope, I would have gotten four blue chips. But I got a green chip. Um, so there's a couple of examples where this can happen in real world. But I want to talk about this testing thing. So when you develop a performance management system in the security space, you want to make sure that you gamify it and you test it. What happens if somebody figures out that they can, whatever the loophole is, to maximize the amount of money that goes to them, or the amount of fame, or the amount of fortune, or whatever it is. Is that a behavior we want, or is it something we don't want? I'll tell you a story about my previous employer. I don't work there anymore. The person that this happened to doesn't work there anymore either, so I feel fine telling this story. There was a period of time where I was responsible for a small group of customer success uh, people, and there was a new incentive performance management structure rolling out. Customer success, typically, if you don't know, are those are the people that make sure that when they're on the platform, they stay on the platform. The customer stays on the platform. Help them with things for integration, things that they might need to get moving along uh, down the pathway of production. Reducing churn. Churn's a big metric that gets checked, right? They were being tasked with, we're going to make all of your variable pay based on getting new logos. Now, that doesn't sound very intuitive, right? What does that do? It turns them into salespeople. I actually talked to them when the VP was on the phone or on the whatever, the Zoom, and, and we were talking it through and he rolled it out. I, I, at this point, I was kind of upset, and I was like, look, this is the dumbest plan I think I've ever seen for a customer success. Because you're telling them to do things that are not in their job description. You're telling them to go be salespeople. In fact, I had my top performer immediately quit within two weeks and said, if you're going to make me a salesperson, I'll just go be a salesperson somewhere else. We actually had two people on the team that moved into sales. And so then, I mean, I only had the team for a couple months, but it wasn't in a great shape when I left because of that comp plan. So, and I, when I asked that guy the question, I said, hey, did you test this? He kind of like, you know, had the, it was over Zoom, so I could sort of tell his facial expression, but he kind of had that look on his face, like, what are you talking about? Test this. This is the plan. Like, why are we talking about this? Clearly, he did not. 
He did not think through the implications of what am I actually asking that person to do based on how I'm paying them. So we're going to run a little bit ahead, which is fine, because the game would have normally taken a little bit longer. Um, so we're tying it to security. So organizational metrics are often not optimized to allow employees to contribute to actual goals, right? So um, security metric of most closed vulnerabilities. Let's say that that's a metric that you have in your organization. How are you going to behave? You're going to find like all those informational ones, all those configuration ones, the ones that are super easy to fix, but probably don't actually move the risk needle at all. And you're going to close all those. You're going to get paid, but does that actually help the organization? No, not the same way that you would expect it to help. The next one, um, this one is a sketchy metric, but I actually literally just heard a salesperson say this this week, and I almost hung up the phone. They were talking about, oh, we, we block the most amount of security attacks, you know, these types of hacks that come in. I'm like, what are you even talking about? If I had that metric, if I could convince my current boss to give me that metric, then I would be licensing like Kali Linux things to just automatically go pound the front door. Right, rack that number up as high as I can. Don't impact production, that's bad, but get the little ticker thing going. Get that thing going up and to the right because then that just means up and to the right for my checkbook, right, for my bank account. Um, the next one is like number of systems moved into compliance with X standard. So this one, like I've seen this one used in good faith, but I think it's not a good faith one because what is missing on here? It should be more of like the percentage of in-scope systems that are compliant with the standard, right? Like just moving the system and saying I'm compliant with this doesn't actually solve the problem you're trying to solve if that system isn't in scope for whatever compliance initiative you're working on, right? Okay, so some better options. Number of days to patch systems. And you can also do that by tier, by class. Like there's a bunch of different ways you can sort of work that out. But if you're looking at those types of metrics, now you're actually measuring what you're showing an executive. So one of the things I learned early in my career is that if you're going to put a graph, you're going to put something in front of an executive, you're trying to tell them something. You're trying to tell them a story and then get them to do something. So if I'm on the other side of receiving some graph, usually the first question that I'm asking is, what am I supposed to do with this? And something like, hey, number of days to patch systems, you know what our problem is, is that these, these, we have this huge sawtooth thing that's going on because of Windows. So like their second Tuesday of every month, we're in a real bad spot, but then we sort of claw our way back up and then we do it again. We can explain that. We can talk about what that is. We can also understand where, theoretically, our most vulnerable parts are, so or parts of the month are, if we wanted to step up controls or uh, turn on some of those additional like alerting things that we may not care about as much when we know that things are patched. Percentage of systems on current patches. Usually when they're not current, why is that? Yeah, applicant breaks something, right? So I can't patch this because it makes the application too slow, or it breaks this computer, or I mean, we've all, I'm sure if you're old enough, you've deployed some patch at some point that's broken something. Um, so percentage of systems on current patches can start to show when you have a problem that can highlight, hey, we've got this one system that's really, really, you know, it's, it's not being patched, it hasn't been patched for three years, it's probably an Oracle database, right? But it hasn't been patched for three years, what are we gonna do about that? Um, the mean time to detect, do you guys use those, mean time to detect, recover, those are pretty popular right now. The challenge there is not everybody knows statistics, so it can be a little bit uh, confusing or you may not understand what a mean is. It's probably more accurate to use that in conjunction with the standard deviation so you can sort of tell how uh, flat or what outliers might exist in your distribution. Um, I actually like this one, the cybersecurity awareness training coverage and scores because you can quite easily, especially if you're doing it at the executive level, you can find the executives that aren't pushing the knowledge management systems that are generally required for most of us in some form or fashion that we have to have our employees trained on this stuff. And then take it a step further and say, oh, sure, yes, yeah, sales, you, fi you guys finally got around to it, but your best score was a 45. Like, that's obviously not great. We, we need you to take it and then retain it so it's not you that falls for the phishing email that, you know, drops credentials in and all of a sudden we have a problem. Okay, so I need to get my notes out for this, but since we talked about game theory, um, one of the things that I like to do here is talk about some of the counterintuitive things that game theory will uh, teach us. So the first one is that people often take aggressive postures that can lead to mutually bad outcomes. So we saw that in Prisoner's Dilemma, right? Like mutually the best outcome for Alice and Bob was to keep their mouth shut because they both only went to jail for one year. That's if they cooperate, that's if they were looking at, e if they were in the same room, right? If in the same room, they're gonna stay silent. You put them in separate rooms, you don't know, they're not able to cooperate their game 
their best option is to always defect because their outcome will be better no matter what happens on the other side. It's either I go free and he gets three years or we both get two years, not three years, right? Okay, next one. Even if everyone agrees an outcome is, in everyone's, uh, is everyone's favorite, they may not get that outcome, right? So that may be the case when you can't coordinate, which is what the blue-green game was supposed to show us, that, hey, if you're not coordinating, if you're not actually um, able to be transparent about this stuff, then it's not necessarily going to work. So uh, a good real-world example that's highly illegal would be if you had a bunch of people coordinate on buying a specific stock to inflate the price and then taking profits on the way out. Now, here's where that breaks, right? Um, you can't tell me that during the early days of GameStop and everyone in their diamond hands that there wasn't some guy who's like, holy crap, it just hit 300, I'm out. But he would tell everybody, no, I'm holding, man. I, no, they're gonna be people that are gonna take those personal gains because there's no transparency, just the way that that works. Um, kind of equate that to I'm gonna look out for number one. The next one, this one's really counterintuitive. You know that closing roads can improve commute time? So it's called the brace paradox. The drivers... And Houston's terrible, right? Because I don't—I live in Dallas, but I've been to Houston enough times, and I've driven in Houston enough. Like it's insane driving around here. Um, you have no incentive to change the routes, right? So each driver individually is going to choose the route that they think is the best for them, irrespective of the system, irrespective of everything else. So something that you may have heard in game theory we didn't talk about was the Nash equilibrium, and that's the uh, the beautiful mind guy, right? Uh, John Nash. So that Nash equilibrium is suboptimal for both the player and the game because the road networks typically are not very efficient. Would you agree that Houston's road network may not be very efficient? Dallas is not very efficient. There's problems with that, right? So if I close a major thoroughfare, how does traffic get better? People find alternate routes, and they'll choose different, or they stay home, or they take the bus. Like, there's different reasons why that happens, so it's kind of interesting. There's plenty of cities uh, like Seoul and Stuttgart and New York City where this has been tested. Okay, this one's fun. Everyone might mimic someone else just because two people do the same thing. There's studies in the 70s on this where... You put 10 people in a room, you got two plants, and the first plant is very, opt very vocal about a particular thing that's incorrect, and then the second plant's like, oh yeah, you're totally right. And then peer pressure causes the rest of the 10 to say that same thing. It could be something as simple, like I wanna say that they tested this with like, uh, scores of football games. Like the game the previous night, they would say the incorrect score, incorrect winner, and by the end the whole room was saying, yeah, no, that's, that's the case, yeah, of course. Um, do you guys, anybody play words, uh, words with friends in here? Okay, do you, do you like the trick, the trick is, right, you don't try to maximize your score, right? You try to block and move around and figure out if I make the best word I can make, but it allows my opponent to get the nasty double, double, triple, triple, that's bad for me. I don't want to do that. I'm better playing a two-letter word that doesn't expose that than I would be playing, you know, a four-letter word that, that creates that opportunity. So that's kind of like, you know, words with friends should be played more like chess than it should be played like, Scrabble. Uh, and the last one here, as drug tests become more accurate, they should be implemented less often. Okay, so that seems a little counterintuitive, but here's, here's why. If an athlete is afraid to dope because there's no question once they are selected for a test that it's going to show up, they're not gonna do it. There's a huge example of this in the cycling world, right? I think we're allowed to say his name, like Lance Armstrong. This is Lance Armstrong. Had the tests been accurate, and he would have been caught earlier. And as I think as we started to understand, I'm not a big cycling fan, but I looked, I read some of the stuff around it. This was like a massive problem in cycling. Like everybody was doping. The drug tests were garbage. So if you have more accurate drug tests, you can test less frequently because people will be afraid to get busted. Okay. If you want to try this at work and maybe set up the scenario differently, I don't know. I don't know what I did differently in this group of rule followers that didn't work. Or maybe get some salespeople involved to help game the system. I don't know. Um, you're, yeah, you're, you're more than welcome. To, so this is, it'll have the links to everything that, that you might need. You can obviously reach out to me if you have questions on this. Um, but ultimately the goal here was just to try to demonstrate that when you are working with your teams, it's I think not only like am I in the position where I'm about to start goal setting, um, I'm managing the current team of goals that they have, but I want to make sure that whatever those goals going forward are, that they're aligned with the company objectives and that there's, if there's a gamification possibility that I'm cool with the outcome, that it's an okay outcome for me to have. So with that, I will open up for any questions because we're dying a little early because the, the game broke. I'm really bummed about this, man. Okay, like, I'll bring so the microphone. 
Yeah. Here, hold on a second. Hang on, we're gonna get it for the recording. Okay, the rule here is yeah. what happens here stays here. But this okay. is my theory. I've worked in trading for like 25 years with a bunch of psychopaths, that's what I'm gonna call them. <laughs> There's better words for them, not professional. And <laughs> so I think what happened in this room for the most part is you've got really good people because I've been in risk control and most of the people like to follow rules. Yeah. But the person who knows if they break the rules, they will do it because it's gonna benefit them. But everybody else is gonna follow the rules. But that rule breaker, they're going at it. And that's why I told my people, I was like, we have to pick one of them and break the rules. Yeah. Because I was like, you're telling us follow the rules. I was like, break the rules. Yeah. And that's that's supposed to be what the whole game is about, is that you're hearing me tell you one thing, but your incentive structure is to do something different. And that's where like you guys are just being such good rule followers. I'm sure everybody's driving the speed limit on the way home. Nobody's crossing the street where you're not supposed to cross. And that's really great for all of our safety. Uh, but it, it didn't make the game go. So, okay. There was another question back here. Yeah. Was it you? That would be me. But like, as you mentioned, did you test it? Yeah. This oh, is okay. the only time it's broken. Oh, okay. Like I've done this scenario half dozen times. And every time there's like, Literally, the, the way you win the game is you always submit a green chip. Yeah. Yeah. The first and third round, they were all blue chips. I, I was in a full-on panic up here because I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do now because it's not working. But no, it's every single time it's worked. And I've even done it in another security audience. So those were not as good rule followers as you guys. So I guess a round of applause for y'all and not for that. But. Thank you, good people. Yes. Uh, does anyone else have a question? Uh, like I said, no question, just a comment. I want to give a shout out to you, Dr. Williams. Uh, you were my professor at UD uh, for the practicum, so awesome. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to come out and show you some love for your uh, for your keynote speak. So thank you. Thanks. There's yeah, also awesome. another student right there next to you who came up to me beforehand. So that's awesome. <laughs> Pound. <laughs> <laughs> that's so must make you feel really good to have your students come listen. It does, yeah. I mean, Especially as practitioners now. Yeah. And I mean, look, be, hopefully the class was worth it. Hopefully the degree was worth it. Hopefully you learned something. I always try to bring something back from, you know, the real world into it. But, um, you know, it's great to see you guys here. And obviously, if there's any question, anybody has any one that you don't want to ask here, uh, because you're such good rule followers, you can reach out to me. The contact info is there, and I'm happy to talk to you. But if uh, there's any, oh, there's a question over there. In the oh, yes, cover. Signature. More of a comment than a question, but I think this also shows an example of what happens when your, uh, your behavior structure, you know, I've seen companies where it's, oh, we're gonna have a performance view, but no one can get over an average or meets expectations. And so no one goes and bothers putting any extra effort in trying to anything. Or even worse, they just do the very basics they need to not get yelled at. So that's awesome because not only are you almost quoting directly from office space, but, um, <laughs> I literally had that conversation with one of my guys yesterday because we were talking about, so on the security team, um, one of the things that drives me absolutely bananas is when a sales ops team will forward the questionnaire, the security questionnaire over blank. Like, bro, they're all the same questions, right? <clears throat> There's maybe like four questions that are unique per company, but the security questions that if they're trying to make a sale and the, the procurement department says, oh, I need you to fill out my security questionnaire. Why is the salesperson not doing that? I looked at him and I said, dude, I don't want you to do that anymore. You don't get paid an extra dollar if we make that deal. The sales guy does. So he's figured out how to manipulate and game the system where he can just say, start you know, yelling and saying, well, they're not doing their job. And then that's why I step in and say, my guys don't get paid for that, buddy. Like your guys get paid for it. Let's help you get set up so that you can answer the questions. And if you, when you build your database of questions, there's not one in there. If there's one in there you don't have, come find us. We'll support it. But yeah, I mean, it's exactly it. There's, there's no additional incentive um, to, to do that. So thank you. I'm just curious about this game theory, um, whether it has been applied to cyber security training. So having people that, hey, here's a way. I mean, if you have enough people that don't break the rules, 
then you know everybody will be good, right? Like the opposite effect that we're trying to accomplish in here, not to break the rule, but actually follow the rules. Yeah. So I wonder if this <laughs> game theory could be applied to that, to get to that purpose. It could, but it's, with all the different external factors here that we found that there was some additional things that played into it, but also you, everybody in here except this team is irrational, right? Because the rational player would submit the green chip. <coughs> I mean, maybe we can spin it that way. I like spin. I'm a glass half full kind of guy, so we can definitely do that. I think that probably the easiest way to demonstrate this type of stuff happening in the real world, that if your company has a fishing training program, that's how you're going to see it, right? So you're going to see the people that, um, again, it's, it's a little bit different because you're playing that psychological game with people to get them to click or do or take an action or whatever it is. But there's usually some perceived monetary advantage. Like, does anybody actually believe that they won some, you know, $3 million prize and it showed up in their work email? No. Like, no. But there are, the, you know, especially with, with generative AI, things getting better and more sort of realistic. When I was at the bank, we got yelled at all the time because we stepped up the fishing training program and they were like, those lures are just too good. And I'm like, what, like, hacker ever said, I'm not touching that system because it's out of scope? Like, everything's in scope to a bad guy. Everybody's going to use whatever information. And the information that we were using to build those were on the public side. Like, we would have a guy go out, take his personal laptop, do the research, get the information, put the phishing thing together. And, like, the worst one, this was actually, it was kind of, we got in a little bit of trouble for this one. But um, we said we were having a Christmas party. It was the building management was doing a Christmas party. And this is right after, like, they canceled all the Christmas parties for the company. And so we said, oh, the building's going to do one. So just fill out this form and log in and, like, add your spouse to it. Because you get a plus one. Oh, man, so many people clicked on that one. Like, and I had one guy that clicked on every single one, and he was like, he had root access for the company. And I was like, buddy, we're going to have to have a conversation because that can't happen. That's fine. No, it's, it, this was made to look official. <clears throat> so the way that we actually combated this. No. 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 So what we did is we, because they're so, like, they're really difficult to spot. And I know we're on a tangent, but hopefully this is okay. What we did is we were a 365 shop, and so we actually issued certificates to the official senders. Because in Outlook, there's a little badge that shows up when it's signed. And we just train people, like if you are getting a company email that looks like it's from the company, make sure that little badge is there because you can't fake the badge. And it shows up on mobile too. Um, but the best part about that is then we had internal people who didn't get the memo that they needed to sign up for it, who were getting their official department emails reported as phishing because it didn't have the little badge on there. It's like security people can't win, right? It's always our fault. Any other questions? Hey, thanks for uh, fighting through it with me. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed it, even though it didn't go out the way we wanted to. But thank you very much. Oh, and uh, yeah, you can leave the, you can just bring them up here. You can leave them whatever. I'll, I'll